If you would, turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 1, as we continue through this, this book, it has been such a joy to preach through this book so far. And we are just at the beginning, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And uh, so much to see, so much to see in the future. And uh, even this week, the section we're going to look at has a lot there for us to consider as well. We're going to be, begin at verse 29, or I should say pick up where we left off. We left off um, two weeks ago in verse 28, so we're going to continue on right as Mark is writing this narrative in verse 29. I'm going to read verse 29 all the way down to verse 34. Hear the word of the Lord. Mark writes these words, Mark 1, 29. He says, immediately after they, that would be Jesus and his disciples, came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. Verse 32. When the evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Let us pray that God would bless the preaching of His Word. Father, may Your blessing be upon Your Word as it goes forth, that it would not return unto You void. Father, we have confidence that Your promise concerning that will come to pass. Oh God, may the Word of God transform Your people. May the sheep of, of the Lord Jesus' fold be fed, Father, with manna from heaven. And may, be, may goats be transformed. May lost souls be brought into the kingdom of Christ. And may your name be glorified as the word goes forth. As we consider Jesus Christ and his healing ministry. His power over the demons. How he changed lives. Not just with physical healing. But with spiritual healing. Inward healing, inward transformation, and how he even does that today by changing sinners' hearts. So may Christ be honored as the word of God is preached. Father, help me, help me to honor Christ for your glory. Amen and amen. The title of this sermon is The Healing Ministry of the Christ. Healing. The idea of healing is something that is actually oftentimes upon our minds, even as believers. Because we are oftentimes praying for family members and friends to be healed of various physical ailments. In fact, we ourselves are oftentimes stricken with illness. And therefore we beseech and plead with God that He would heal us and relieve our illness we also consider our brethren who are Pentecostal, brethren who are in the charismatic movement, who oftentimes speak of, of great miracle healings happening at their services, happening in their midst all the time. In fact, I myself have experienced people such as that telling me those very things. In fact, I recall one time a man told me that he knew of a man who raised people from the dead. What are we to think of these modern miracles? What do we think of miraculous things happening, happening like this by people seemingly all the time? What are we to consider? Or how are we to consider? How are we to conceive of miracle gifts today? And in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, how are we to conceive of His ministry when we go to the Word of God? We must go to the Scriptures to understand how the Lord Jesus performed miracles. What the effect was upon those who were healed. We even see the mercy of God revealed in that. We see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in that. That He came along and would 
relieve people of their physical sufferings by His grace. So that He gets the glory in that. And we're to consider also how Christ, by His own power, even heals people today. Both physically, God still heals even physically, but more import importantly, spiritually heals. And so these things are some of the ideas and concepts that we are going to see propounded, put forward in this section of Scripture and other Scriptures as we consider them. As we go through these things and as I preach this morning. Before we do consider these truths, of course, we must check the context of this verse. We must remind ourselves just brief review of what we have considered already. And even just briefly, where is Mark going to take the rest of the narrative in this chapter? We saw, as I said two weeks ago, in the previous verses, in verses 21 through 28, Jesus' teaching ministry in the synagogue. And how he casted out a demon there in the synagogue. And manifested his power and his glory in that. In fact, uh, verse 22 and verse 27 says that the people were amazed. They were struck with amazement because Christ had manifested His power and His glory. We know obviously Jesus at this point had His disciples along with Him. Those first four disciples He called. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And we've considered that three of those men were in His core group. And so they are alongside of Him even in this narrative. As we see in verse 29, 29, it says, and immediately after they came out of the synagogue, that would be Jesus and those four disciples with Him. And later on in this chapter, in verse 35 and then verse 36, all the way down to verse 39, we see the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, specifically in terms of His prayer life, how Christ was a man of prayer. I'm excited to consider that verse next week. And also how He spoke on Preaching being his ministry focus. So that's the textual context. That's, that's what surrounds this verse. So we know where it sits in the narrative. In the greater narrative that Mark is writing here. It's also important to know culturally. Nothing of this magnitude happened in Jesus' day. Nothing like it. This is Jesus healing people like this. Casting out demons. There's nothing like it. In fact, it was a rarity. It wasn't like people were doing this all the time. Certainly not. This is truly miraculous. That's why the people, as I said just a moment ago, when Jesus cast out the man, the demon that was in the man in the synagogue, the people were amazed. This is something they had not seen before. In Jesus' culture, there in ancient Israel, there was nothing like this at all. And so let us keep that in mind as we go through these verses, as we look at these truths. We can only imagine the amount of astonishment that people were experiencing as these things were taking place. So there are three main things I want us to see. Three points that I want to make in this sermon as we look at these few verses. Firstly, I want us to consider Jesus' is healing Peter's mother-in-law. And that's in verses 29 through 31. Secondly, I want to consider how he was healing the crowds. That's in verse 32, 33, and 34. And then thirdly, I want us to consider the doctrine of miraculous gifts. Do people have such ability today to do what Jesus was doing in these verses? So let us look at the first one. Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. Verses 29 through 31. Firstly, we see the illness under this header. In verses 29 through 30. It says, and immediately after they came out of the synagogue. So this would have been on, again, on a Saturday or the Sabbath day during this dispensation, during this time. So they, they're done with services in the synagogue, they're done with this, and they leave, they go out of the synagogue, and it says they came into the house of Simon and Andrew. 
with James and John. This probably would have been something that the Jewish people were accustomed to doing. Perhaps spending time fellowshipping on the Sabbath day. There were many restrictions as to what they could do. And so therefore, why not rest together? Why not rest in the presence of others? Perhaps for entertainment and just for the aspect of fellowship. In fact, it's a good practice even for Christians to do that. On this day now, the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath. We, this, this day is a holy day, a day of rest. A day in which we set aside to worship. A day in which we consider the resurrection of our Lord. And it is a good practice that we meet together. Perhaps even in our home. In our homes and houses. To fellowship. To consider the truth of God's word. To discuss those things. To pray together. To sing unto God with one another. In fact, some of the greatest times of fellowship I've ever had with my brethren. Have been after services. After set meeting times, more spontaneous, organic times when you meet with other saints and worship the living God, fellowship around the truth of the gospel. There is great unity there. There is much to be experienced there with that. And so there would have been a, a, perhaps a common custom that the Jewish people did this. They met in houses after synagogue services there. So as I said earlier, the four disciples are here with the Lord Jesus. They go into, into Simon and Andrew's home. So they're there in Capernaum. Verse 30 says, Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. So here we find the illness. We find the issue. This first conundrum that Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And this wasn't just what we would consider today to be a fever, like, oh, I, I was just lying sick the other day with a fever. This was serious. In Jesus' day to have a fever was deadly. It was life-threatening. In fact, uh, Luke, and as many theologians and scholars have believed that Luke was a physician, that Luke had pretty thorough medical knowledge. And so Luke writes in his account of the story, in Luke 4.38, he says, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. This was threatening her life. This is dangerous. And so therefore it says, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Straight away. They did not mess around. They weren't waiting. They weren't just, this wasn't casual. This was urgent. There's an urgency here. And so therefore, after having seen the Lord Jesus themselves, with their own eyes, cast that demon out of the man in the synagogue. That would have been fresh on their minds. I'm sure that there was a measure of confidence in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Son of God, that He had the ability and the strength to heal. And secondly, therefore, we find the healing. The beginning of verse 31 it says, and he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her. So the Lord Jesus comes into the room where she's in, and he takes her by the hand, and the fever's gone. This deadly illness that she was afflicted with is taken away. In fact, this is a, a very similar story to what we find later in Mark. In Mark chapter 5, very interesting. There's a very similar story. And you're probably more familiar with this story. This is a more popular healing of the Lord Jesus. Verse 21 of Mark 5. It says, When Jesus had crossed over again the boat to the other side, so this would have been the Sea of Galilee, He's crossing the Sea of Galilee. It says a large crowd gathered around Him, and so He stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, And on seeing him, fell at his feet. Verse 23. And, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing on him. 
Later on, we, this story is actually interrupted by another healing. And then we pick up at verse 35. It says, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? So this is not only a, a healing, this is, a, this is raising someone to life. Raising the dead. Verse 36. But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So we find those three core disciples there. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They ridiculed him, they laughed at him, verse 41. Taking the child by the hand, he said to them, or he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Verse 42, immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. So Christ, very similar. Christ comes in, takes her by the hand, and raises her up. Now, did Jesus have to actually physically take her by the hand in both instances? Surely not. We know elsewhere Jesus healed just by saying it. In fact, Christ didn't have to say it. He could just heal. He could just heal someone and that be that. However, it was to show that He was the source of the divine healing. He himself was the source of it. That he's the great physician. He's the healer. He's the creator, sustainer, and upholder of all things. And all power is in his hand. And so therefore, he comes to her and takes her by the hand. And the fever's gone. This high fever that once threatened her life is gone. Thirdly, we see the result. Continuing on in verse 31. It simply says, And she waited on them. So she's not just in this state of recovery. She has been fully recovered. She has been fully healed. She's not in a state of, I'm starting to feel better, Jesus. Just give me a few days. I'll, I'll come by and spend some time with you guys. She's immediately, absolutely, 100% restored to health. And it is evidenced by what we find there at the end of verse 31. She waited on them. She, of course, being the woman and the homekeeper, comes alongside these men and waits on them. She serves them. It's very interesting to consider women in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. As I was contemplating this verse... The role of women in the Lord Jesus' ministry was quite special. In fact, we find that when Jesus, the night before his crucifixion, what happens? Even, even disciples who were truly converted, they were afraid, so they fled. So Jesus is there alone. And we find at the crucifixion of Christ that there's a group of women in the distance looking on. That speaks volumes. Who were the first to discover the Lord after he raised from the after he was raised from the dead? Women. They had a very special place in the ministry of Christ. It's interesting, the world often criticizes Christians who actually believe the Bible and say women should not preach, women should not teach the Word of God, women should not take the authoritative position in the church. And they often say that the, woman, the woman's role in the marriage is submission and humble gratitude under the authority of her husband. And the husband's role, of course, is to love. His wife lays his life down for her. And oftentimes the world will scream at us and accuse us of hating women or belittling their role, but actually we uphold it, the rightful role of a woman. And the Lord Jesus here in His ministry had a very special place for women. In fact, just very briefly, in Luke chapter 8, you don't have to turn there, but in Luke 8, beginning of verse 1, it says this, Soon after, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. So we have the twelve disciples here. But then verse 2 says, And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, 
and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. So we have not only men following the Lord Jesus, not only the twelve disciples, but these women coming along, and they were even supporting them in the ministry out of their own means. So these women had a, had a veneration and respect for the Lord Christ. And as I said earlier, we find in Mark 15, in verse, uh, verse 41 and 42, that women were there at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, at a distance, looking on. Pretty incredible. Their place in the ministry of our Lord. We even know in the early church with Priscilla and Aquila, they held a very high position in Paul's eyes. They were to be honored for their service to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also important to note that the result of spiritual healing of healing from the Lord Jesus is service to Him. Notice there in verse 31, there is an interesting truth put forth in this text that she was healed and then immediately what happens? She goes and serves. That carries over into the spiritual reality that when Christ comes unto a man and calls him out of his deadness to sin, raises him up in spiritual life, he is now a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, we have been freed from slavery to sin so that we become slaves of Christ. And when one is a slave of Christ, that is when they are truly free. The result of healing, the result of spiritual healing to Christ, and here a physical healing to Christ, is service unto Him. Because of gratitude, because of gratefulness toward God. In fact, Paul said in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, first line of the book of Romans, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, a doulos, more better translated, a slave of Christ. Pretty incredible. Paul certainly was grateful for his salvation, and immediately after being saved, he becomes a slave of Christ. Have you become a slave of Christ? Or are you still a slave of sin? That is the question. And brethren, are you submitting yourself unto your master? We are not our own. We do not own ourselves. Away with this idea that we are the, the masters of our own destiny. Christ is the master of our destiny. Christ is our master. He owns us. We have no rights. We have no, slaves do not have rights. We have not rights. Christ is our Lord. Do we live in gratitude and gratefulness for His having saved us, having bought us out of the slave market of sin? So even though this narrative here in Mark 1 concerning Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law is quite short, just three verses. It is packed with truth. But we must continue. The second point I would like to make is Christ's healing the crowds. And that's in verses 32 through 34. The needy crowds come. Look at verse 32. It says, When evening came, after the sun had set. Now that's important as well. So in the Jewish mind, the day did not begin in the morning when the sun rose. In, in, in kind of our Western mind, we, we think that the day starts when the sun is raised. Even though technically, this day starts after midnight. When the first hour comes, that's when the day technically starts. But we typically talk about it as if the day begins when the sun is rising. That's a new day. However, in the Jewish mind, the new day began when the sun had set. When it became dark, it was a new day. So for the Sabbath day, on Saturday, when the sun sets, the day's over. The Sabbath is over. You can work when it becomes dark. It's now Sunday. So in their minds, they could not come to Christ on the Sabbath. That's how strict it was. Sadly, the, the, the legalism of the Pharisees had become so constricting, they couldn't even bring the sick. Couldn't even bring those who needed healing on the Sabbath day. They had perverted something that was glorious. 
They had perverted something that was glorious, brethren. They took the Sabbath day and made it a burden. The Lord Jesus said, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, my friends. So let us steer clear of anyone putting a yoke upon us concerning the Sabbath day that we cannot bear. Let us steer clear of those who say that on the Sabbath day we have to follow so many rules it becomes a burden. It's lost its point. The whole point of the Sabbath is a day of rest, a day of worship unto God. The Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, is a day that we, that we take ourselves away from work. We restrain ourselves so that we might worship, enjoy, and glorify God and fellowship with the brethren. It's not a day of we have to watch everything we do lest we break a rule. The scribes and the Pharisees had thrown so many rules, it became a burden. So the people, having been constrained under that legalistic system, waited until the evening had come. Waited until the sun had set, so it's dark. Then, what does it say? They began bringing to him all who were ill. Now, as we remember, if you remember two weeks ago, I noted that Capernaum was quite a, a busy city, a bustling community. There, were, there was a pretty large fishing industry there. So, we can infer from this text that there was probably a lot of people. There was a crowd. In fact, we know that there were a lot of people because verse 23 says, the whole city had gathered at the door. So it says, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. So they bring the sick and the demon-possessed. I'm putting more emphasis this morning on the healing, but the, the demon possession, Christ casting out the demons, that was even a manifestation of His power as well. Certainly it was. And we considered that a couple of weeks ago. The whole city had gathered at the door. There was an excitement. You can imagine the word got out after services in the synagogue. Word got out, brethren. People knew what had happened. Doubtless, people knew. And perhaps, even word got out right after Jesus had healed Simon's mother-in-law. So you can imagine, hearing word that he did it in the synagogue, goes to this woman's house, heals her, It was pretty powerful. Very, very powerful. I want us to consider something very briefly, though. It's Jesus and his relationship to the crowds. Jesus and the crowds. Very important. I want to consider, firstly, who are the people in these crowds? Not necessarily this crowd, but generally speaking. In Jesus' ministry, when he had the crowds following him, listening to his teaching, listening to his preaching... And perhaps even the crowds who followed him for miracles, for healings. There are even this crowd. What was the makeup? Who were, who were amongst these people? Well, we know obviously that his disciples were amongst these people. His twelve disciples. We know from what I just read there in Luke chapter 8. That women as well, believing women who followed Christ truly were amongst these people. We also know that um, elsewhere in the New Testament, Jesus also sent out a group of 72 disciples. So there was many true disciples. However, as Jesus taught many times, there were false disciples in their midst. There were people who identified themselves and aligned themselves with Jesus Christ in the midst of those crowds, yet were lost, yet were unconverted. And I want to consider how Jesus dealt with the crowds. We have a lot of preachers today in America, and around the world even, even in Africa. There's big crowds in Africa, a, a, a somewhat revival there, not necessarily a good kind of revival. There's, there's a lot of false teachers in Africa. They have huge crowds, huge crusades, thousands of people. And a lot of the prosperity gospel is popular there in Africa because of the poverty-stricken nations 
People want to believe that gospel because it means you get rich, happy, and healthy. And wealthy. So these people today, these men, these preachers, these false teachers, it's interesting how they deal with the crowds. They tickle their ears. They say what they want to hear so that the crowds just increase more and more. But let's look at how Jesus dealt with the crowds. Luke 11 is one place. Luke 11, verse 20, 29. Listen to what it says. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, now I want you to know something. When preachers today start getting an increasing crowd, what happens? The message starts to be softened. So it makes more room for more people. They start to tickle more ears so that the crowds increase. But notice with Jesus, when the crowds start increasing, listen to what he says. He begins to say, this generation is a wicked generation. That's one way to start your sermon. So much for the jokes. So much for making a joke to open up your sermon. He says, it seeks for a sign and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up. That would be the Queen of Sheba. Will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them. Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater is than, than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment. And condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. That's pretty strong. That's pretty bold. There was a stark contrast between the way Jesus dealt with the crowds and men today deal with the crowds. There are even saint preachers. Even men in this county. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of large churches, Baptist churches, in this county? Are they preaching the hard message of the gospel? Are they preaching soul-wrenching, heart-convicting gospel? Are they bringing the offensive message of the cross? It is offensive. It is not something that is neutral. The gospel is like a razor-sharp arrow that pierces the heart. It gets even harder in Luke 14. Luke 14, 25 says, Now large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them. So here again we find large crowds following Jesus. He looks back to them and he says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Verse 33, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. There is no room for selfishness. There is no room for feelings. There is no room for anything of that sort. You must die to self and live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's powerful preaching. That's strong preaching. Where are the preachers in Lawrence County? Where are the preachers today that will stand up and preach this? Preach this gospel. What do we hear instead? Well, it'll only take you five minutes. Just pray this prayer. It's easy. It's not easy. Salvation is a free gift of God's grace, absolutely. But having that gift, possessing salvation in Christ, Christ now possesses you. And you are a slave of His if you're His. If you are in Christ, you're a slave to Christ. And that ought to bring your heart joy. Otherwise, you know not Christ. If the idea of being a slave to Christ makes you uncomfortable or makes you dread it, surely you know not Christ. And if you are not actually a slave of Christ, then you surely do not know. Think about if I said I was a rich man's slave. Let's say a man lived down the street from, from my house and I said, I was his slave. I went around telling people I'm his slave. But never did they see me at his house tending his needs. Never did they see me around him following after him and doing everything he commands. They would conclude I was lying. And yet, 
What do we find, friends? People who say they are children of God, slaves of Christ, but they are not in His courts. They tend not the courts of Christ. They do not follow after Christ, listening to His very call, listening to His voice as it is brought forth in Scripture, and obeying every one of His commands. It's not a burden to a genuine Christian to obey Christ. In fact, when the Word of God is preached, the Word of God is preached with conviction and boldness and passion and fervency. One of the reactions of an unconverted heart will say, legalism. Just, oh, you're being a legalist. A legalist teaches that salvation is by works. It's not legalistic to preach holiness. That's not legalistic. Or it's not legalistic to preach against Halloween, something that's coming up in a few, a few days. That's an evil holiday, brethren. We need to pull ourselves away from that. We, need to not, we do not need to take place. We do not need to take part with the deeds of darkness. What does the Scripture say? But rather expose them. Brethren, let's be out and about on Halloween, but not, not, not participating in sharing the gospel. Those people need Christ desperately. Desperately do they need the Lord Christ. Holiness, brethren. Holiness. And Christ preached that. His words to the crowds were strong and powerful. In fact, one more place I want to look at very briefly. In John 6, one of the most famous passages of Jesus conversing with the crowd. John 6, verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. So notice, the same thing that's happening. In Mark 1, they hear of Christ's healing abilities. So they follow after him as a great crowd that congregates. Verse 3. Uh, verse three. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. So he's sitting up, he's on this high position, he's about to teach. Or excuse me, I'm sorry. He's actually about to perform the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He then walks on water. That happens, that takes place. Later on, we, we find in verse 26. So the crowd is still there. This is Jesus speaking to the crowd. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Wow. He gets right to the heart. He doesn't play around. He says, here's why you're actually following me, because you want to just get food. So look at what he tells them in verse 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So he says, don't worry about your physical body. Don't worry about food. Seek after spiritual nourishment, spiritual life from Christ, the bread of life. Verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 41, look at what he says. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. So now he gets, he gets some backlash from the crowds. Now they're upset. Now they're grumbling. Verse 43, Jesus says, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Down in verse 48, it says it again, I am the bread of life. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Listen to verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? In other words, what he says is too hard. We can't bear what he's saying. Verse 61, But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Verse 64, But there are some of you who do not believe. In, in a crowd of people, even in churches, some of the most amazing churches, there are people who do not believe. 
For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And who it was that would betray him. And listen to verse 65. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So not only did Jesus bring these hard words, these convicting, powerful words, but it had effect. And many of the false disciples were not following Him anymore. Were no longer walking in the crowd. They did not want to be associated or aligned with Christ any longer because the call of discipleship was too much. They loved their sin. They loved themselves too much. They thought, as many Southern Baptists do today, that you can be in Christ and be in the world. That you can love Christ and love the world. That you can be a child of God, yet you can live however you want because once saved, always saved. And that is wrong. Once we are saved, we are always saved. But when we are saved, we are saved from ourselves. We are saved from how we, by default, would live, which is in sin. And we are not saved to walk in righteousness. So there are dangers in being in the crowds. Dangerous. It is dangerous to be in a crowd. To be going with the flow. Because one, you lack individuality. You are a part of the whole. You're part of the group. Instead of considering their own individual responsibilities and what you ought to do. Christ dealt with people individually and even in His preaching. He speaks to them as individuals. Yes, as a whole, but as individuals. It's, it's going to the heart directly, not just the group as a whole. Secondly, you lack resolve. In a crowd, one lacks resolve because you're going with the flow and so you don't have the conviction. You're not going to say, this is the hill I'm going to die upon. I'm going to stand here. So, brethren, that's why it's important. That if there is a crowd, we find ourselves in it. That we know this. Keep this in mind. Lack of resolve. You just go with the flow. Just go with whatever the crowd says. There is a psychological aspect to that. And a spiritual aspect to that. And when you're a group of people, you just automatically want to fit in. It's human nature. You want to be a part of the whole. There's nothing wrong with that inherently, necessarily, but when it starts touching on spiritual realities and truth, and the crowd is moving in the wrong direction, and society is moving in the wrong direction, the world's moving in the wrong direction, brother, we ought to take ourselves out of that and stand upon the mount of the gospel and say, we are resolved, we are standing right here, and we are not moving to the left or the right. As the crowd is going to hell, we are standing upon the truth of the gospel by the grace of God, for the glory of God. And as they are, as the crowd is moving, as this flow of people is on the broad path, and we're on the narrow path going to life, let us look back and cry out. Not look back to go back. Look back to cry out and say, For God so loved the world, Christ has come in the love of God. And friends, the grace of God has been ex extended unto you. Grab hold of Christ. Lay hold of Christ. And thirdly, as I mentioned, in a crowd there's a lack of salvation. There's a lack of genuine true salvation. I mean, I can, and I use myself as an example a lot just because I was a false convert for so long and experienced so much as a false convert. I myself was just in the crowd and my lack of salvation really didn't bother me and I, didn't, I was ignorant of it because everyone else was like that. For the most part. There were some genuine people around me. Genuinely converted people. But the other young men and women I was around, they were falsely converted too. In fact, my sister and I were just talking about yesterday. Friends of ours. Who were, were, were contemporaries with us in our schooling. And we look at them now. Children out of wedlock. Drug abuse. Others just... Lack of zeal, lack of passion for the things of God. They don't, they don't care about Christ. They just don't care about living for the glory of God. It really breaks my heart to see that's where they are. 
But I fit right in there. Because they were all, as I myself, lost. Lost. Very few of them were truly converted. Now I want us to consider also, going back to Mark 1, verse 34 there, the merciful healing of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was mercy. He had such a mercy. In fact, I love the text in Scripture when it says, He saw the crowds and He had compassion on them. So glorious. That the grace of the Lord Christ is great indeed. Verse 34 says, And He healed many who were ill with various diseases. Various diseases. It didn't matter what kind of illness they had. Paralytics. It didn't matter if they were if they had a high fever, as, as Simon's mother-in-law did. It didn't matter. Christ had the power to heal. Matthew agrees. Matthew 4.23 says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. This also carries with it spiritual truth. That just as Christ has the ability to heal every kind of physical illness, so too does, does He have the inherent power to save from every kind of sin. If you are an unbeliever and the thought arises in your mind oftentimes, I cannot embrace Christ. I cannot be saved. For my sin is too great. This particular sin that I am in is too powerful. Oh dear friend, do not blaspheme God. Do not blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. He made you. He made, he made all things. He has all power. Omnipotent. All powerful. To save from sin is nothing for our broad-shouldered Savior. Christ can save from any sin. Pornography, drunkenness, drug abuse, hatred, self-righteousness, pride, enmity, strife, jealousy, self-centeredness, you name it, Christ can save from it, and He can save from it to the uttermost. Also, we see Jesus and His casting out demons. Continuing in verse 34 there. Look at how He has total power over them. It cast out many demons. Not just one, not just two, many. He had the power to do as many as He desired. And notice also, He did not have fellowship with these demons. No fellowship has light with darkness. Christ with Satan. The kingdom of God with the kingdom of the evil one. It continues, it says, And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. That, that is, I covered this a couple weeks ago, but I want to cover it more thoroughly so we understand the background of this. What does this mean? Why would Jesus not permit the demons to speak? Because as we see in the previous verses of this chapter, in the synagogue, the demon cried out, I know you're the Son of God. Why isn't that a good thing? Even the demons are preaching the gospel. Why isn't that a good thing? Well, to understand it, we have to understand the background of what was going on there. We have to understand that Jesus had been accused and was going, well, in Mark's area, he was going to be accused of casting out demons by the power of Satan. Perhaps you're familiar with the story. In Mark chapter 3, verse 20, this is part of the narrative. This is Jesus was accused by the religious people of his day by casting out demons by satanic power. Verse 20 says, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, that is, Satan. And they said, He cast out demons by the ruler of demons. So, that was the accusation. Jesus has been accused of having power over demonic forces because He Himself was being controlled by demonic forces. And notice what the reply is of the Lord Jesus. Verse 23. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But he is finished. 
Verse 28. Truly, truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. I'll, I'll just briefly address that. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Very, very simple. It's revealed there in that text. That the issue is resolved in the context of that verse. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is attributing the work of the Lord Jesus to demons. Because you're rejecting the fact that Christ had been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we see in Mark 1, who descended upon Christ in His baptism? The Holy Spirit. Who empowered Christ to preach and to teach? The Holy Spirit. Who empowered Christ to heal? The Holy Spirit. Who empowered Christ to cast out demons? The Holy Spirit of God. We talk about it in the covenant of redemption. Going back to eternity past, the Father and Son covenant concerning us, concerning our salvation. And who joins in? The third person in the Trinity agrees to equip Christ to do what he did in his perfect life. And then to apply the work of redemption to our hearts. So the Holy Spirit equips Jesus. And what, what, who were they blaspheming then? The Holy Spirit. They were attributing the Spirit's work to Satan. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So oftentimes Christians say they're struggling. They're struggling. They feel like, feel like they've committed it. Brethren, it's an impossibility for a Christian to commit the, the unpardonable sin. Because a, a Christian who's possessed by the Holy Spirit would never, ever say that the ministry of Christ was performed by Satan. Certainly not. Therefore, it is an impossibility for a child of God to commit this sin. So take heart, brethren, if you've ever struggled with that. Very clear that that is what that sin is. So Jesus is accused of that. And his response was, that it was blasphemous against the Holy Spirit and it would never be forgiven. And so therefore, in his ministry, when these demons would cry out that, he did not permit them to speak because he wanted to separate himself from the kingdom of darkness. Imagine, imagine they said that. If, uh, for example, let's say Jesus is casting out a demon, the demon cries out, I know who you are, you're the son of God. And so the Pharisees and scribes say, look, he has fellowship with them. They know him. It's because he's casting those demons out by the power of Satan. And so the Lord Jesus, in order to keep himself from such distance, distances himself from those demonic forces. The third point I would like to make, and it's very brief, is the doctrine of miraculous gifts. Because we see it just so often in the ministry of our Lord. And the question often is asked by Christians, do these gifts continue on? Are we in the age of miracles, the miracle gifts specifically. No Christian would deny that miracles still happen today, that God can certainly, miraculously save, uh, uh, save someone from a physical calamity. No one denies, I mean, even I, I myself do not deny such. I don't know of any Christian that does. And certainly we know God performs spiritual miracles today, raising sinners to, to life. But the question is, does God still dispense the gift of miraculous healing as he did in the early church? We see the apostles and their contemporaries on demand could heal someone. It was so powerful. It even says they took cloths from Peter. Or no, I'm sorry, not cloths, excuse me, Peter's shadow. If you walk by someone who was sick, even just his shadow falling on them would immediately heal them. The question is often asked, does God still dispense those gifts to Christians today? To be able to heal on demand as such. Before we answer the question, I'd like to consider the historicity of miraculous gifts. And I'm not just speaking of healing. I'm talking about um, pro prophecy. Being able to foretell the future. Tongues, as, as was revealed in the early church. Other, other miracles one could do. The prophets even were at times enabled to do miraculous things. I'm speaking of all the miracle gifts. Briefly, the historicity of the miracle gifts was this. There were only three periods in all of history that God allowed these miracle gifts to permeate. To be very common. Three periods. Firstly, the period of Moses and Elijah, uh, Moses and Joshua. Excuse me. We see him, obviously Moses getting the Israelites out of Egypt, performed many miracles. That was miracle gift by God, and we see in the wilderness as well. Miracles happen by Moses' hand. That M M Moses had the ability, a very special ability, to perform miracles on demand. We even see it in Joshua as well. Secondly. Elijah and Elisha also both could perform miracles very powerfully. Almost on demand, one could say. 
And the other, the other prophets could at times, but it wasn't consistent. Elijah and Elisha was very consistent in that. So that was the second period. Third period was Jesus and the apostles. Could practically do it on demand. And when we add up all the years of each of these periods, it's not even 200 years. So out of the 6,000 years that this earth has been around, uh, of all time, 6,000 years, there's only been a period of less than 200 years where God has dispensed giftings, in biblical history speaking of, where people are able to perform these miracles consistently over and over and over. And secondly, what was their function? What was the function of these miracles? It was to validate the message of God. That's simply it. It was to validate the message of God. To validate the revelation that God was given through Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, and then Jesus and the apostles. It was to validate the message they were preaching. And then thirdly, their cessation. That is, that they've ceased, they've gone away. We see two, there's really two arguments for this. The scriptural argument and the historical argument. Scriptural being that in scripture, we see these miracles happening. But then as soon as scripture is stop, it stops being written at the end of the first century, revelation is done, miracles stop. Even by the time of some of the later epistles that are written in the New Testament, miracles seem to have happened much less. In fact, Paul talks about he and his companions being sick. Paul was sick? Why was Paul sick? It seemed to, be, it seemed to indicate that even Paul himself has started to lose the ability, lose this gift of just on-demand, continual healing. Even he tells, he tells, uh, tells Timothy to drink wine for his frequent ailments. Why didn't he just heal Timothy? Why didn't he just send a, a prayer call? Some of these ministries talk about it. Why didn't he just send a, and just anoint a prayer call, send it and just say, touch this, Timothy, you'll be healed. It seems to be that Paul and himself, even, that, that had been even restrained from him. As the first century comes to a close. And the historical argument being that, and this, this is very closely conjoined with the scriptural argument, after the end of the first century, they just stopped. Miracle gifts stopped happening. Now, again, I'm not saying God can't perform miracles. Certainly He does. He does today. But it's by His own way. And people don't have this ability as Jesus and the apostles did. Moses, Joshua did. Elijah and Elijah did. To practically on demand. As sometimes a lot of our charismatic friends will like to claim that they do have. And really, the whole modern charismatic movement is not even 200 years old. And really, before that in church history, there was hardly anyone who claimed to be having these abilities. So let us deal with grace with our Pentecostal brethren, our charismatic brethren, but also let us lead them to the truth in grace, in love. So that ultimately they look to the miracle that God is performing today much more than He is now the other ones, the physical ones that took place. And that leads us to the question, does God still do miracles today? As I said, yes, He does. Certainly they're not as often. God doesn't, I mean, I've never even heard of someone actually miraculously, you know, lying in bed sick and just instantly healed. God typically uses ordinary means. That's just typically God's way of operation now. Is that, and it's always been, even, even in the Old Testament way, in the Old Testament days, in between those periods, you know, in between the period of Elijah and Elijah and Jesus and the apostles. There's hundreds of years in between. God used ordinary means. In between the ministry of Elijah and Elisha and Moses and Joshua, He used ordinary means to heal people. So He certainly does, physically. But brethren, let us turn our eyes to the greatest miracle that is being performed all the time. All around the world, God is calling His people to Himself. And it is salvation. The miracle of salvation. Salvation is a miracle, friends. Brethren, it is a mighty miracle of God. That God takes a dead sinner and regenerates them. Raises them up to spiritual life. Even the life of Christ was all miraculous. Born of a virgin. Fulfilled the law. Died upon the cross. Was raised on the third day. Miraculous. Ascended into glory. Miraculous. And even in our hearts today, God has done a miracle in me. I've never been miraculously healed from an ailment. When I was sick, when I've been sick, I've been sick. God has used ordinary means to heal me, medicine and other things. But I can tell you this much. God has supernaturally, spiritually healed me, raised me up to spiritual life. That's what's most important. The charismatic movement puts too much emphasis on physical healing. 
Because that will, that still doesn't matter about your soul. Your body's all going to come to dust one day anyways. So even if someone is physically healed, what, is it, what's the matter, what does that matter in eternity? In fact, I've seen on YouTube these charismatic false teachers will go out in the streets and do evangelism, quote and unquote. And they'll go out and supposedly heal people. And never do you hear them preach the gospel. Never do you hear them explain the cross of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and that the sinner must repent and believe upon him. They only go out and heal people, and then that's it, that's it. They might say, Jesus loves you, or something, just some little cliche phrase, and that's it. There's no preaching of the gospel. And that breaks my heart, because that person was only made more comfortable on the road to hell, on the road to destruction. And the healing was even fake, too. So it was a placebo effect on top of that. So brethren, let us be discerning. Let us ultimately look to the fact that Christ has that power. To heal both physically and spiritually. And he does both today. One, typically through ordinary means. The other one, always supernaturally. Always supernaturally. So brethren, I encourage you to be edified by these truths. To apply them to your own heart. Be diligent. See, this is the part I can't do. I can't apply the text to your heart because I don't know every aspect of your life situation. There's an active part to listening to the preaching of God's Word. And that's considering the truths and by the power of the Holy Spirit discerning how that is applied to your life. So that's my exhortation to you, brethren. My exhortation to you who are religious but lost is to examine yourself. If you say you know Christ, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And if so, then you're in the church, you're in the kingdom of Christ. And the exhortation I just gave applies to you. But if not, if you see that you are like many people in the crowds who are you're offended by the word of Christ, or you say you are a slave of Christ but are not truly living for Him, then the call of the gospel is to repent and believe it. Or if you're outright paid, outright unreligious, irreligious, then come and believe upon Christ for life, eternal life. So we have seen here that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, healed the crowds. And we've seen the doctrine of miraculous gifts. Truly the greatest miracle is salvation. That God being holy and righteous and just, yes, gracious and compassionate, but holy, giving His law, His holy commands. As we considered this morning in Sunday school, the covenant of works, first given in the garden, then republished at Sinai. Ten commands. We cannot keep a single one. They show us the character of God, but they show us our character in light of the character of God. That we break His law. We lie, we steal, we blaspheme, and we deserve hell for our sins. Deserve the just penalty. All mankind, all of Adam's posterity has fallen in Him. But praise be to God that in eternity past, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in grace, in perfect love, covenanted, to save the people of God. That when the fullness of the times came, Christ came into the world to save sinners and fulfilled the law on our behalf and then died upon the cross there bearing the wrath of God against us and our sin, took ownership of our rebellion and then three days later was raised to life as the public display that God had received His atoning work at the cross as the perfect payment for our sins. He's alive today and forevermore. Praise be to God. And the call of the gospel is that the sinner must repent and believe and embrace Christ so that all sin, past, present, and future, is forgiven on account of Jesus' work at the cross. And the Father gives the righteousness of Christ to all those who repent and believe. They're seen as if they lived Jesus' life because Christ was seen as if He lived theirs. He takes my sin. I receive His perfect righteousness. It's a glorious exchange. All by grace. And for the one who's been truly saved, they have a new nature, a new heart with new desires. They now love the Lord their God and hate sin because they've been changed. They've been saved all by the grace of God. All for the glory of God. That's what it's all for, brethren. All healings that have ever happened, physically and spiritually, the whole entirety of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was unto the glory of the triune God. So to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
May He be glorified in each and every one of us. And as we leave this place, may we leave having been changed by the Scriptures. As the Lord Jesus prayed for His people in the garden the night before His crucifixion, in John 17, 17, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. We pray all these things through our mediator, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.